His Holiness Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Chairperson of the International Women's Conference, Madam Banumati Narasimhan, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. This conference is about achieving harmony in society through connectedness by promoting individuals to go beyond their narrow self-interests, to transform selfishness to caring for others and sharing with them for the betterment of society. The theme of this first session this morning is making a global connection. I understand that uh, the conference wishes to explore how individuals as well as leaders can help transform society from a violent, uncaring one to a harmonious society. At the outset, I would like to briefly state my view of what I think is a good leader. There exist and have existed leaders of many types and hues. But true leaders are those who make better humans of others, giving them a vision of a better world, inspiring them to greater heights. True leaders possess, possess the gift to inspire others, to subdue and control the animal within others and lift out the good and humane in them. Such leaders have the ability to give a nation the strength to reach unconquered heights. On the other hand, bad leaders have destroyed not only individuals but entire nations. We have many examples of that in the past and even today all over the world. A good leader has the rare ability to put the common cause before his or her personal interests at all times. This implies that he must act with extreme commitment and sacrifice. He must be honest in every way with regard to realizing his stated vision as well as in monetary and material dealings. We also know that an effective leader should possess the humility to heed the voice of others, even his opponents, and the generosity to engage with them in free discourse. The courage to say I was wrong and the self-confidence to arrive at compromises. A good leader lights up the darkness, giving hope to the desperate and courage to those who will not dare. I must hasten to add here that for a leader to be a great person may not suffice. He, she has to be effective. For this, I believe that the following main things are required. First, a clear vision of what the leader wishes to achieve for his project, for his people, whether it be the leader of a country, of a nation, of a government, the leader of an organization, the leader of, of a society, company, anything. Then an effective plan of action, as well as the tools and materials to implement that vision. And finally, unswerving honesty, transparency and commitment to the vision. I must hasten to underline that all this requires many special qualities from a leader. However, they are not difficult to cultivate. All of us humans possess such qualities within us. We only need to do some hard work 
to bring forth the good in us while suppressing the bad and the horrid. The world has been blessed with many great leaders, while there have also existed destructive ones. The lists are too long to be mentioned here, and I'm sure you know most of them. Now I would like to mention, as I see them, some of the most dangerous temptations for leaders. First, the greed for power. Second, the greed for wealth and money. The two are interconnected. I'd like to quote here from the words of Sri uh, Sri Ravi Shankar. He states somewhere that corruption begins outside the perceived boundary of connectedness. However, boundaries born of this end of quote. However, boundaries born of narrow, limited perceptions of self and self-interest begin to dissolve when we recognize our global connectedness, that we all belong to one world and that we are all connected in many different ways. When individuals only think of themselves, corruption and crime begin to take root in society. When a leader forgets why he holds power, that the power bestowed on him is held in trust on behalf of those who gave it to him, the power and that it is never a trust, a right given him to abuse power for his personal benefit. It is never a right given him to abuse power for his personal benefit. He begins to believe, when he forgets all this, the leader begins to believe that power is a God-given gift to him. Power is a unique privilege given to him, so he can do what he likes with it. Then begins the corruption. He then says, I can rob whatever I want from the state, Never mind that it will lead, that it will bleed the economy and destroy it. Very quickly, the two attitudes of the greed for power and for wealth and money begin to be self-sustaining. In order to continue to rob, the leader has to consolidate power. In this process, he cannot permit any dissent nor opposition. So, so he must destroy all those who dare to oppose. Thus all norms of democracy, freedom and democratic governance are destroyed. The leader must, in order to consolidate his power, then build his family around him. After me, my sons, my daughters, my brothers, my sisters, my in-laws, their children, and no one else. This becomes terrible. One has to then resort to anything, to kill, to intimidate anybody else who stands in the way of that project. They have, on the other hand, to rob as much money as possible, which is not theirs, which belongs to the people, in order to operationalize that project of power. They have to ob obtain obeisance and avoid displeasure amongst their followers. So they begin to encourage and facilitate corruption among the followers. Within the institutions of government, which seeps right down to the people. A political culture of corruption, practiced with utmost impunity, takes over. The soul of a nation is thus destroyed. The ethics, the spirituality, the caring for others are replaced by self-interest of the leaders and their cohorts. The poor can continue to be poor. 
the underprivileged must tolerate their suffering. We, the leaders, will continue regardless, along our path of self-glorification and enrichment. This is a very dangerous attitude and policy for leaders. What solutions can we employ to resolve this? I don't have a magic wand for this, and I don't think any one of us do. But I would humbly propose that education, education and more education in every way, would be a major solution. Education at home, education in the institutions of learning, schools, universities, and so on, education by religious leaders would definitely be, would be able to attack the root of such problems. We know that education is not only about learning of books and the acquisition of knowledge. It is equally importantly about the acquisition of good ethics, morality, spirituality. All this has to be taught. We are not born with it. It is not in our genes. It has to be taught by our parents in our homes, by our teachers at school, by our lead religious leaders. School is the most important institution that fashions a person's life from childhood. A child spends most of his waking hours in school and very little at home. Teachers have a sacred responsibility to fashion children to be good human beings, whilst giving them, of course, the required knowledge and skills. Hence also the importance of institutions such as the art of living to educate and develop the spirituality of individuals. Here, I would like to end my pontificating and perhaps very briefly talk about my experience as a leader because I think I stand here as such and that is why perhaps you thought of making me a part of this great event. I was asked to talk about this, if not I don't normally talk about myself. As a leader, like most leaders, especially in our part of the world, in a poor country, and in addition a country which was at war, a civil, a terrible civil war, the challenges were immense. I shall limit myself only to the two major temptations I mentioned earlier and how I managed to overcome them, power and corruption, the greed for power. Perhaps first I never forgot that it was a sacred, that power was a sacred thing I held in trust for the people who put me there, that I had no divine right to hold that power in any other way if not for the people's wish, that I had no right to guarantee my children, my family, my everybody to hang on forever after me, that I had to go home when I finished my duties. Then one begins to think differently. I knew that I had no right to help myself to state assets or demand commissions for government tenders, thereby pauperizing the state and bleeding the economy because corruption will increase the costs of every development project in a country by massive amounts and the country pays. Therefore, I remember I came in screaming against corruption and we did quite a lot of things for that within the first few months itself. We brought in laws, we amended the constitution, we brought in regulations, practices, procedures, 
tender procedures were streamlined and published and all tenders had to be uh, done accordingly. Institutions were, uh, were built for procurements of government and of course laws to punish the corrupt. And I did not at any moment, at no point did I influence the judges or the people in the bribery commissions, bribery and corruption commissions and such like institutions to change their decisions as I wished. Once they were appointed, I never ever spoke to them. Then I believe also that personal conduct of the leader is extremely important as I, as I stated earlier. In guaranteeing honesty, integrity, the transparency and good governance. If the leader falters, then there is no end to what can happen and what will happen. Another example of how under great stress, of course, I was able to keep myself on even keel was to go back on the way my parents brought us up and bring up my children like that. I remember as uh, when I was introduced, it was mentioned both my parents were heads of government for long periods. We were three children in the family. We had one car between the three of us during the entire periods of my parents' terms in office. One car. Today I know that in many countries, especially in our part of the world, each child disposes of 15, 20 cars. In-laws, relations, aunts, uncles, this never happened. My children, during my 11 and a half years in office, between, I have two children, between the two of them, they had one car to use. And one example that I never forgot was once when we were young, I was a teenager, we were all teenagers, the three, my sister, my brother and I, we had one car, my sister had taken the car and gone somewhere. I needed to go somewhere urgently. I asked for another car, of course, an official car. When I came back, my mother was there. She had finished work, unfortunately for me. She was standing there with her hand on her hip and she said, who do you think you are to command your government vehicles like this? You should have waited for your sister to come back or postponed your trip. This scolding never ever uh, was forgotten. And of course then I educated my children to behave like that. One day that I was really proud of my children was when when I was president. I used to work a 15 hour day and take 15 minutes to half an hour for lunch. And after lunch I had just rushed into my bedroom to freshen up or something and I heard the floors in president's house were boarded, are still boarded. I think uh, my children thundering past my door which was closed. They didn't know I was in the room. I came out and said, what's up? And then they came into my room and said, this is what happens when you take over the presidency despite our protests and we told you, we cried and told you not to take over these positions and we cannot live as normal human beings in this country. Why? Because they had gone to a shopping mall stood in the queue outside the shop because the shop was narrow, there was a little queue normally and the shop owner had noticed them and come outside and try to take them inside before the others who were in the queue before them and they had said no that's not fair, we do not ask for such privileges and they marched off came home And I got the scolding for becoming president <laughs> because they were f being forced to take privileges. All I could say was, well done, I'm proud of you. So I think 
the ethics of leaders, the morality of parents, the spirituality of, of leaders is the most crucial and essential factor that can change society and nations. And also, <laughs> magnanimity is the final thing I want to talk about. A leader has to be magnanimous. He or she cannot be vindictive. Because you are the leader of everyone, including those who have opposed you, including those who have abused you, including those who may have harassed you when you, before you became a leader. You have to be magnanimous. If not, you lose uh, being a leader, you lose the role of being a leader. There were times probably I was not magnanimous because I'm not like Guru Shri Shri. <laughs> I have a long way to go to come there. But I will do that in this life, I do not know. But I did try whenever it was possible. I had to handle a vicious war. I was not the only one. Many other leaders before me and after me had to handle it. But at every point I did not forget that those who were waging the war, a minority community in our country, an important minority community, were very different to the civilians who belonged to that community. I never mixed up the terrorist fighters with the Tamil civilians. It was difficult, but I didn't. Just one example. I, as I came in to power, I invited the terrorist leaders for peace talks. We had an eight-month uh, ceasefire and talks, but they kicked it in the teeth and went back to war. So we had to, as a state, wage the war. But right through this whole process of military conflict, I kept inviting them. Sometimes confidentially, not publicly known, sending leading people to talk to them. And we were able to alleviate certain things. We finally got the agreement of the terrorist organization to de keep developing the northern province, which was at war. And we started a developmental process. They didn't want government officers to go and do it. I said, OK. We will have the international people coming. International organizations came in. They couldn't say no to the international organizations because they counted a lot on, international, on the international community for many things. And the development went on apace while the war was going on. We rebuilt the roads, we rebuilt the bridges, we rebuilt the schools, we rebuilt the university. Not perfectly. We rebuilt the hospitals to which some of the terrorists would come when they were injured fighting our soldiers. But the hospitals were rebuilt. And then finally, when there were, they attempted to kill me in a suicide bomb attack 14 years ago, it was during a presidential election, and I was elected as president two days after the attack. And in my acceptance address, I invited, the, the main focus was inviting the terrorists again and pleading with the, terror, the youths who were being recruited to forget the hatred and the enmity and join hands with us to, uh, to make our peace project a success. This was in a speech two days after I nearly got killed by the terrorists. I invited them to come to peace. That speech is published and it is available. I think it's also on my website. So I think it's not an easy thing. I was bad-mouthed. I was abused by the extremists. I'm still abused. Recently, my foundation, after retirement, I work with international foundations and I have two of my own foundations. We had a very, I think, good program for religious harmony because we are having some problems due to a small handful of extremists in our country. I was abused. I was called the mother of liars for talking about religious harmony. 
in the major government newspapers editorial but we go on it doesn't matter i was asked yesterday by some of the gurus here when we were having a, a chat what gives a leader the ability and the strength to do this kind of thing i do not want to go into it it will take a lot of time i've already taken too much time but i think very briefly it is the values that were given me by my parents they taught it to us but also we watched how they lived and learned by example then our education at school we went to school at a time that the schools believed that they did not have to just stuff the children with knowledge and what was required to pass exams we were also taught how to be good human beings then of course as a buddhist the buddhist philosophy and the buddha's teachings have stood me in great good stead the concepts of tanha greed how to overcome it the concept of mitta karuna upeksha to be a good human being to achieve spirituality and of course i never forgot the very important seminal con- buddhist concept which exists in hinduism and lot of the other religions other great religions the concept of impermanence that nothing lasts forever we may be today at the in the highest position but tomorrow we can be right down and those who we trampled may be there that so and also of course my knowledge and study whatever little i was able to study of the teachings of other great religions all these gave me a little bit of the spirituality that uh, the art of living tries to give us the mi- minor human beings to achieve greatness and to go beyond our selfish beings and to reach those heights which were meant for human beings to, to reach thank you